Um, basically, Organic Athlete, I kind of started myself, and it's been a, a lot of time and effort but um, on, on my part. But late, the past few months, it's people have come out of the woodwork, volunteers to really come help out. And you see they're wearing these shirts and the orange tags, and they're the people making this happen today. And, but my friend Lenny has come on board, and she's really excited to make this happen. She's a, a big part of uh, make an organic athlete go to the next level. So she's going to introduce uh, our next speaker, Doug Graham. And Doug, when you come up, if you could put this on. Um, <clears throat> well, there's all kinds of things that I can say about Dr. Douglas Graham. Um, I met him about five years ago when I, on my own quest for health, was looking for some answers about health and nutrition, and uh, preferably through the raw vegan movement, which I had been experimenting with for a couple of years, but had been failing on repeatedly um, due to a variety of reasons. And when I came across uh, Doug, the first thing I thought was, wow, he's fit. And the next thing I thought was, wow, he's only I can eat fruit. <laughs> this is awesome. And uh, I started implementing his program, and to my surprise uh, and pleasure, it just continued to work. Um, and as uh, a friend now of, of that entire time, five years, I'm blessed to have gotten to understand the information that he has to present. And I've seen him present tons of times. And aside from being a huge inspiration, um, and motivation to people all over the U.S. that I have met. He's a really great friend to everybody that he encounters. And um, I think that there's probably nobody more qualified to speak on the topic of nutrition and physical performance than Dr. Douglas Graham, who has extensive experience. He's been a raw vegan for 25 years now. Uh, he has also uh, trained Olympic level and professional athletes with this lifestyle, getting them uh, their peak performance. So it is with my esteemed pleasure. <laughs> Got to. Okay. Ah. Cool. Okay, we're good to go now. Now you're happy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lenny. Uh, I've I've spoken in many basements um, <laughs> in my time. <laughs> I've done a lot of presentations in basements, but this is the first one that was above ground level, I think, in my life. Uh, it's kind of different and see if it still works above ground. Uh, there's so much material to cover and and so little time and I really want to make this as useful a presentation as I can and so I'll avoid as much fluff as possible and get down to uh, essentially nitty gritty as quickly as possible. Um, today's presentation is is the sex life of the Central American Sloth I believe, if, if that's not what you're here for, it's, no, okay. Um, sports nutrition, in a nutshell, is very, uh, very challenging, I think, because literally every situation is unique. It's almost hard to pre-play um, what you're going to need for a, any given date, if it's a future date other than today because weather conditions play such a huge part in sports nutrition considerations. I, I remember training for the 1988 Orange Bowl Marathon and I was living in the Florida Keys so to, tra to run in the Orange Bowl, which was just Miami, I figured, oh, it's perfect, it's perfect and the weather is going to be the same and, and I can train all winter, the event wasn't until February and so I just trained through the winter and I came up with a lovely strategy. I left my house, I headed, I headed east on a road that, that basically went east because, well, that's the only road there was. There's one that goes east and the other, one, the other side of it goes west. And that's the only road there is because <clears throat> it's just a string of islands. So I'd head east and I would just run until I saw the sun come up over the horizon. 
And as soon as I saw the sun come up over the horizon, I'd scurry home like a scared rabbit. And, and as far as I could get until I saw the sun, I could always make it home again from any distance, it turned out, without having to bring anything with me. And I got used to going out for 15 and 18 and 20 and 22 miles because I could go out 11 miles and turn around and run 11 miles if I turned around when I saw the sun. If I waited for 10 or 15 minutes, it was a completely different day. And I did that through the whole winter, did my long runs with no problem. And of course, uh, Florida Keys tend to have very moderated weather patterns. And throughout the winter, it was basically in the 60s or 70s every morning when I'd go run. And on the day of the marathon, the day before the marathon was the 10K, and it was spectacular. Misty, 60s, couldn't have been better. I'm thinking, wow, it was made. This is going to be idyllic. Wake up the next morning, the sun is shining, the wind has stopped, the heat is up, the humidity is high. It's February and there's humidity. And when the gun went off, it was 88 degrees. Not perfect for a marathon. Well, this is, <laughs> um, I didn't have a lot of experience in marathons and I just did what I've always done. And by the time I drank water, which was somewhere around mile 16, I was in serious trouble. Just serious trouble. I was, it was humbling to finish that marathon. It was absolutely humbling. And um, I'll, I'll admit that it took me over five hours to complete it. And I never actually did get down on hands and knees, but it sure felt like it a few times. Um, and so the prep very often is going to be based on the unique conditions of the day because heat and altitude and, and barometric pressure and cloud cover and wind and relative humidity and how tired you are and how hydrated you are from the day, all of these things are going to affect your needs on any given day. But we can at least cover a few basics that we know don't change as much. And since most of the time we're training, I know a few people who only compete is there anybody here who only competes and never trains? That is a strategy in training that I have met a few people who say, look, yeah, I compete two or three times a week. And at whatever I do, usually it's race walking, but it's not just race walking. And I compete a couple times a week and I never train. And that is one training strategy. But for most of us, we train a lot more than we compete. And so um, there are basics worthy of considering. And, most of them have to do with either fuel or the nutrients required to properly process that fuel. Can we go, can we go that far in nutrition and still be in agreement? Um, it's interesting because in the 60s, I was really interested in sports nutrition because I was trying to lose five pounds. I was a gymnast and I competed in track and field and all I knew was that if I could be five pounds lighter, Iron Cross would be a whole lot easier and the other things that I was trying to learn how to do would be a lot easier to do. Anything that required strength, if I could just drop the five extra pounds. So I was playing around with a lot of different things in, in what I thought was sports nutrition, but to be quite honest, I didn't have a clue what I was doing and, and most of what I tried was, would be laughable today, but uh, one guy one guy came up with a, an idea, a guy named Dr. Cooper came up with an idea where he started stressing the idea of cardio exercises and coined the phrase aerobics. And then shortly after that, another man came up with an idea, or I should say popularized an idea that has been debunked before he presented it and has been debunked thousands of times since he presented it as being physiologically unsound, in fact untenable, impossible. But the idea nonetheless caught hold because people wanted to buy into it and the idea was called carbo-loading. You've all heard of carbo-loading? Well, as an athlete in the 60s, when I sat down to the training table at school, uh, we were served all the meat we wanted and potatoes. And this idea of carbo-loading literally totally turned the tables on that idea and you were served all the potatoes you wanted and the meat. You know, and, uh, and it was sort of interesting though because the athletes, even though physiologically the idea was debunked, people were eating a diet that was so starved of carbohydrates 
compared to their actual carbohydrate needs, that by eating a day or two of high carbohydrate food, it would result in improved performance for a short period of time because they were actually finally just, it's like if you drove around on a half a tank of gas all the time and you said, well, my car is only good for 200 miles. My car is only good for 200 miles. And then one day you filled your tank up and you go, wow, I can get 400 miles in my tank if I just fill it up. You know? <laughs> but it, it's just you'd been running around on half empty all the time. Not only that, because you still were running around, you weren't even running around on carbs. You were trying to convert fat to carbs and protein to carbs. And, and the bodybuilders are right. You do need more protein if you eat a diet that is starved of carbs. But you need that protein to convert it into carbs, which doesn't really make that much sense if you're trying to be an athlete. Why use fuel to convert fuel into usable fuel if it, when you could just consume it as fuel? Let's use our fuel to fuel our muscles for physical activity rather than for nutritive and digestive processes. So in the 60s, a whole revolution happened in the world of sports nutrition which eventually resulted in people eating a higher complex carbohydrate diet if they wanted to be into sports of almost every kind. It was fascinating because this led to higher level performances, which put more stress on both the equipment and the training techniques available at the time. It wasn't long before technology followed and started to provide for the increased demands of athletes. And throughout the 70s and into the 80s, we saw a revolution in sporting goods. And there's no more bamboo or metal pole vaulting poles. And ice skates changed. And bicycles changed. And what used to be a light bicycle today would be a clunker and spandex, and, and lane lines, and all sorts of things changed in the equipment f that was available to athletes. And the stuff we take for granted now, it not only got better, but even it got safer. And training techniques for gymnasts went from gymnastics being a death risk sport to a sport where you can land on your head and not get hurt because you're landing in a pit of foam. And so you can try that again and again and again until you figure out what it is and you don't get, I mean, it used to be a deadly sport. And if you watch films of the 60s gymnasts, you realize that any eight-year-old kid that's into gymnastics could do what the men and women were doing back in the 60s. It was, it was very simple because the learning ability with the equipment wasn't there. Well, now we've got better equipment and better nutrition. And what follows, of course, is that the coaches eventually catch on that they've got better athletes. And they need to find new ways to place a challenge in front of those athletes, more demand, better ways to create demand. And so we do. We started creating higher level demand, came up with drag shoots, came up with plyometric training, came up with bands, came up with all sorts of ways. I don't know if you ever saw, if you ever saw Holyfield, when he was at his peak training in the gym, he literally was tied to the floor by a ring of bands and another ring of bands overhead. And he was tied in by 20, 30 different bands. Any direction that he tried to move, it was resistance. He couldn't go down, he couldn't go up. He couldn't go in, he couldn't go out. Everything was tied to resistance. In order for him to move, for Evander to move at all, he had to overcome the resistance. When he got in the ring, I mean, nobody could touch him. He was so fast and so strong. And the innovative techniques, well, it turns out that today, you all have access to everything that everybody else has access to. You've got access to the best equipment. You've got access to the best training tools. And we've come full circle. It's time for nutrition to take hold yet again. Because if you want to have an edge in performance, if you want to reduce your risk of injury, if you want to hit your own peak performance, if you want to, if you want to see what your body is capable of, what your mind is capable of, and you don't want to be hampered by your own lifestyle, we have to come to terms with the fact 
that everyone in the room knows how to train beyond your ability to recover. Anybody argue with that? You can train beyond your ability to recover. You can train in a few hours what could take you 24 or 36 or even 48 hours to recover from. It's time to start making an art and a science of recovery. And people that I work with, when I work with athletes, and all they have to do to qualify is be motivated, because I don't want to want it for you more than you want it for yourself. What I start to teach is the art and science of recovery. What this allows for is peaking performances and extended careers with reduced injury rates. If you can recover more rapidly, you can train harder. You can train more frequently. You can train with more intensity and still recover more rapidly than you could in the past. It's amazing. And the, the key, essentially, is to get you to recover in approximately 22 hours. Because if you're on any kind of a regular cycle of training, it's very typical that if you have 22 hours to recover, then you can start again and you're on a daily cycle. If you need 24 or 26 or 28 or 30 hours, then every once in a while you're going to need a day off. If you need 36 hours or 48 hours, we hear about the, 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 the weightlifters saying, I need 48 hours to recover. I'm going, they're so, they're, they're so proud of it. I'm going, why would you be proud of that? Wouldn't it be like way cool if you could recover in 22 hours? And say, I train so hard. I go, it's not that you train so hard. You just don't know how to recover. If you could learn that recovery, to me, that is what smarter is all about in the world of athletics. Because we all, we all know how to train. I mean, what's there to learn there? Yes, there's, there's little tricks. Granted, we can all refine our skills. We can get better at it. I'm not, not knocking that in any way. But, but what we don't know is how to recover. I did a, I did a literature search. I checked through 50 different books on, on sports nutrition, sports training, sports physiology, went through some serious texts. The most I could find was one paragraph about recovery. Usually there was just a sentence. And the sentence basically read that if your heart rate returns back to within 10% of normal, within two minutes, you're acceptably fit. If upon resting from exercise that makes your heart rate go up, your heart rate goes back to within 10% of normal within one minute of training, either it wasn't intense enough for you or you're incredibly fit. End of recovery. Well, I needed to know more. So I started doing my own bits and pieces of research and trying to figure out what it was all about. And, and and I had the good fortune of working with sick people. And in, what I found out is that all my, all my youth years, I've been, I've been very lucky in that I've been introduced to athletes, and introduced to athletes, and introduced to athletes. And, and, and when I was a kid, I didn't even realize how good these guys were and these gals were. But they, a lot of them were national champions, and some of them were world champions. And, and ever since, I've just always had my finger in that arena of working with athletes. And they just sort of get led to me somehow. I, I don't really go looking for them. But then after I graduated from chiropractic college, I opened up a retreat for sick people, just to help sick people get well. And ran it for 10 years. And what I found out was that they wanted the exact same thing as the athletes wanted. They just wanted to learn how to stack every card in their favor. They just had a different endpoint goal. They just wanted to be able to function. But if we started stacking every life point, every lifestyle point in their favor, what we found is that people got well, sick people got well. People, who, people would come to me with letters from their doctor. And, and I'd go, okay, well, this is going to be valuable. You know, this is going to be instructional. What's the doctor have to say? And I'd open up the letter and say, Dear Dr. Graham, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and go, okay. <laughs> yeah. And Anyway, we started putting a lot of attention into little fine nuances of lifestyle, really starting to see what things were. And, and eventually came down 
primarily with the, with the terminology to be able to describe the vocabulary, to be able to describe what I do well enough so that other people could understand because it's a bit challenging. We've been trained, literally everyone in the room has been trained with a specific model of our understanding of how health happens. And that model is called the medical model. Now not everybody here perhaps buys into the medical model. If you don't, you buy into the alternative medical model, which is the exact same thing. <laughs> and so we've all bought it, we're trained in the medical model, which essentially says this, that the conditions, substances, forces, influences, whichever of those four apply, but that the conditions required to attain health when we are in poor health are completely different than the conditions required to maintain health when we are in good health. End of story. That's how we were trained. And so there's a war on drugs, but if you're sick, you take drugs. Radiation is deadly if it comes from Nagasaki, but if the doctor gives it to you, it's good for you. If you get scared enough, inject me with anything, do what you need, cut me, whatever it is. Milk is good for you, but if your child is sick, don't give him milk, it'll make him sick. And we live with these contradictions that the conditions required to regain health when we're sick are completely different than the conditions to maintain health when we're well. And the people who went to the alternative routes and realized that the medical, the medical people didn't drop the ball, they just never had the ball. <laughs> when it came to health and performance, that's not what they do. And instead we go, well, you know, I don't, I don't use drugs. For when I get a headache, I go see my chiropractor or I go see my acupuncturist. And I go, yes, and the reason you have a headache is because of the shortage of needles in your shoulder. I mean, we know that's not the reason people have headaches. Now, eventually, I, I came across a different way of looking at the world which said that the conditions required to maintain health when in ill health are the same as those required to, or to regain health when in ill health are the same as those to maintain health when we're in good health. And I call this a health model as opposed to a medical model. And we all need sunshine and we all need physical activity and we all need hugs and we all need human touch and we all need laughter and we all need sleep and rest and fresh air and, and, and the food that we're designed for and on and on. And the only thing that happens is the only differential that I make is that the conditions have to be modified to meet the needs of each individual each day. Other than that, the conditions required for health are the same either way. So with that in mind, I can then present the health model in terms of nutrition and performance, which is very simple. We have an unlimited supply of fat. Fat becomes a non-factor. A fairly thin person, if we take Christian or myself or somebody whose body fat levels are in single digits, we still have an awesome amount of fat available for human performance on any given day. If you run a mile at a moderate pace, a reasonably fit person is going to use approximately 50 calories of fat to do that. There's 3,500 calories of fat in a pound, which means that you need to run about 70 miles before you'd burn off a pound of fat. I mean, I'm sitting here at a fairly low body fat level, but I easy have five or six pounds that I could use for fuel before I'd get into any of my body fat that was really required for insulation purposes. It's just a little extra you carry on you. It's a reserve. So I can go 350 miles on the fat. Your body has an ability to store fat and it has no ability to store protein or carbohydrate. Yes, you have functional levels of both within various parts of your body. There's protein involved in the function and the makeup of every cell, both in the cell membrane and in the nucleus. And there's carbohydrate in your liver, and there's carbohydrate in your bloodstream, and there's carbohydrate in your muscles. What do we call that carbohydrate when it's in a complex form in animals? Glycogen. Glycogen. And the same stuff in plants is called ooh, starch. Starch. So it's the same thing. It's just got a different name. Glycogen in animals. Complex carbs. We convert it down to simple carbs, glucose and fructose, to use as fuel. 
and every cell in the body is fueled by glucose and fructose. Even that fat that we were using for fuel was getting converted into glucose. And in the presence of carbohydrate, that fat converts to glucose very efficiently and very cleanly. In the absence of carbohydrate, it's a rough process to perform. It's fuel intensive to perform it. it. It affects your brain function very much the way that alcohol does, small doses of alcohol. And when people get to that point where they're trying to convert fat into sugar in the absence of carbohydrates, say at the end of 18 or 20 miles of running without refueling, we call that what? Bonking. Yeah, bonking, exactly. <laughs> if you're a bicycler, you bonk. If you're running, you hit the wall. And, um, and we don't want that to happen. But that's only applicable for certain people in certain situations. The possibility of everybody in the room being an ultra-distance runner is slim. I would, eh, how many ultra-distance runners? There's one. Okay, so I don't want to leave you out. But we have unlimited essentially unlimited supplies of fat. We do use protein as fuel. It is physiologic fact that we use protein as fuel. You can find it in any sports physiology book. We use protein as fuel. It's fact. Approximately one-tenth of one percent of our total fuel usage comes from protein. It can be as much as one-quarter of one percent can come from protein. And if you starve your body sufficiently for carbohydrate, you can use even as much as one half of 1% of your total fuel use for the day from protein. Yes, you do use protein. But on average, it's only one-tenth of 1% 1 if a, if a typical lady in the room uses 2,000 calories, 1% 1 of that being 20 calories, one-tenth of that being two calories. We're talking about a half a gram of protein per day is typical. Three quarters of a gram for a guy is all we're talking about. It's not a lot of protein usage. We get left with carbohydrate. Carbohydrates become an issue. Essentially in sports performance we've been taught by the TV commercials that there's really only three issues, aren't there? There's sugar, there's minerals, and there's water. And that's all I want to talk about for a couple of minutes is sugar, minerals, and water. Carbohydrate, minerals, and water. Now when I say sugar, please understand that complex carbs are also sugar, but they're just not sweet tasting sugar. They taste bland. They're complex and they're called complex for a reason. It's because their molecular formula is complex, but it's easier to just remember that they're too complex to digest. Take a tablespoon of cornstarch, put it in your mouth, see how long it takes you to digest that. You'll have a dry mouth for 10 minutes. We don't have the digestive enzymes to digest the oligosaccharides that comprise a great many of the starchy foods. We literally do not have those enzymes. We cannot break them down. They also exist, by the way, oligosaccharides in unripe fruit. But when fruits become fully ripened, the sugars in them are referred to as glucose and fructose. It's a fascinating thing because essentially in sports nutrition what we're looking for is to answer a simple question. How well does it become you? How quickly does it become you? In order to become you, it's got to go through a couple of stages. It's got to go through digestion. It's got to go through absorption. And it's got to go through assimilation. Until it gets assimilated, it's not you. It's almost you by the time it's been absorbed. It's en route. But it's got to be, it's got to get through your digestive tract at least into your lymphatic or bloodstream before we can even hope to make use of the nutrients we're consuming as food. And it's interesting because the sugars that the body uses as fuel are glucose and fructose. And the sugars in fruits are glucose and fructose. Now, almost all the other nutrients that we consume, almost all, not all, have to be digested before they can be absorbed. It's grammar school nutrition, grammar school biology, but not glucose and fructose. Glucose, you can, you can literally absorb it under your tongue. You know that little hole where water shoots out once in a while? Anybody in the room that can do that automatically on, on call? Nobody? Every once in a while somebody can. But it happens to all of us every once in a while. You actually can absorb sugar through there. 
If you leave the fruit in your mouth long enough rather than gulp it down, you can absorb some of the sugar straight into your bloodstream through that little hole under your tongue. When the sugars get to your stomach, they require no digestion. They're already in a readily assimilable form, glucose and fructose. They drop into your small intestine and get absorbed directly into the bloodstream without requiring digestion. This is fascinating stuff. It essentially means that while you're eating the second half of a peach, the first half of the peach, the nutrients are already in your bloodstream. That's fast. I'm actually not recommending a diet of fast food. I'm recommending a diet of instantaneous food. <laughs> What gets into your bloodstream the quickest? Air. You breathe in, it's in your bloodstream. The transfer is so fast and so effortless. It just transfers across a membrane. <sighs> Oop, that's already in. It takes no time whatsoever. It's, it's amazing. It's less than a second. And then what's next? Water. You gotta have enough water for all the reasons we know. If you're not, I, Typically athletes know, but just in case you don't know, if you don't have enough water, you can't transfer nutrients into your cells, you can't transfer waste products out of your cells, and you start to feel tired. It's going to have an adverse impact on performance, as we know in sports, you know. Uh, you wait until you're thirsty, you waited too long. I don't recommend the drink 8 to 12 glasses of water a day concept. I recommend not consuming foods that result in thirst concept. Why should I consume something that requires an antidote? Water is the antidote. If a man is dying of thirst on an island, on a desert island, he's out there dying of thirst because he can't drink the salt water, can he? What would happen if he drank the salt water? He'd get thirstier. He'd get thirstier. What would happen if he kept drinking it? Of what? Dehydration. He'd die of dehydration drinking water, but it's salt water. Which I always find a fascinating concept that people will dehydrate the salt water and then consume the salt. Now we know you can live a long time on just water. The record's 367 days. We're not going for the record, but that is the record. We can go 367 days on just water. And yet, samurais commit suicide by eating salt. Americans eat 1 50th the lethal dose of salt every day. They're, it's a slow suicide. Or not so slow. But water gets into the bloodstream inc incredibly quickly. If you're not having enough water in your system, how would you know? There's got to be a way. My whole system revolves around monitoring and objectifying. Monitoring and... Ob Who lifts weights in this room? You lift weights? Do you use rubber bands or do you use real live weights? Real live weights. Do, no. you, do you ever check to see what weight they are or do you just pick up the nearest ones to you? I check to see what weight they are. For each lift, you know how much weight you can lift, essentially. What do you mean? Like, well, curls are different than presses are different than still hold yeah you know you essentially know how much to pick up or is it always a guess I just have a regimen so I mean you know whether to pick up a 10 pound dumbbell or a 100 pound dumbbell I mean you have a you have a ballpark figure yeah. okay that's called objective or objectifying you have a number that you can put to it as opposed to subjective where you say oh well that looks like a heavy weight I think I'll try that one or that looks like a light weight I think I'll try that one that's very subjective. It's nice to be able to put a number. Nice to be able to put a measure. Anybody here ever take their pulse? You know, you end up with a number. Oh, you don't want to say fast or slow. We end up giving it a number. All right? Temperature in the room, what time it is. We objectify things. It's nice to be able to objectify. How do you know if you have enough water in your system? Okay, if you don't pee. <laughs> You prob but that takes a while, doesn't it? The color of the pee. Color of the pee. That tells you something. What color are we looking for? Clear. Yeah, literally clear. <coughs> literally clear. It should appear clear. Yes, there is color in it, even when it appears clear. There is a little color, and it would have built up eventually. But we're looking for clear. If it doesn't appear clear, you are dehydrated to some degree.
need to add in water. How else? Color. Frequency. Medical, medical profession says if you pee less than five times in 24 hours, you are medically dehydrated. Fewer than, tw fewer than five times in 24 hours. If you pee more than 15 times in 24 hours, you probably have what they call sugar metabolic disorder of some type. And if it goes beyond 20, it's just darn inconvenient. <laughs> as well as, there's probably something else going on. If we split the middle between 5 and 15 and come up with 10, this is what I'm recommending. Urination, 10 times per day in a 24-hour period. I call normal 10 times per day. 8 to 12 if you want to range. If it goes less than 8, you should notice. Just like if you start peeing egg yolk, you should notice. If it gets down to 5, 6, 7, you go, whoa, I'm really dehydrated. I need to up, I, this, I didn't pee much in the last 24 hours, it's just, it, yeah, I only peed six times. I need to add more water in before this becomes a problem, before it starts affecting my performance. Color, frequency, and? Volume. Volume. Okay, oh, here we can be subjective. <laughs> there's two kinds of volume. There's scanty and there's satisfactory. Okay, there's even copious. <laughs> but we shouldn't have to get there. But certainly, if it's copious, you probably held it longer than you needed to. <laughs> but there's ways to monitor. We have to watch this because cause water is more likely going to be the thing that affects your performance. Before it's even sugar, before it's even minerals, water is going to be the deal. You have access to all the air you need, you have access to all the fat you need, you have access to all the protein you need. That's all been covered. Now we can start fine-tuning it. Water, if you're not getting enough water, my approach is to simply not eat foods that make me thirsty. Which foods make you thirsty? Salty, Salty foods, that's one kind. What other kind? Bread. Dried out. Bread. Dried out. Anything that's been dried out. So dehydrated foods certainly would make you thirsty. They're going to take water away from you. Normally when we think dehydrated, we think dehydrator. Who here owns a dehydrator? Okay, and who here owns a stove? Isn't that just like a really fancy dehydrator? <laughs> That's an expensive dehydrator. You put stuff in the stove, doesn't it dehydrate? Like really effectively. Okay, anything cooked unless it's been boiled in water, is being dehydrated as it's being created. Literally all cooked food at that point becomes dehydrated, dehydrating food. It's also, by the way, no longer whole food because we've removed the water. All cooked food is refined food. Separate issue for people interested in eating whole food. Can't do it if you're eating cooked. So the man's on the island. I didn't forget about him. He didn't die in that short amount of time. And he's dying for lack of water. And you give him water, and he springs back to life. Fine. When you gave him water, did he become less toxic? Probably. By adding water, he became less toxic? Yeah. How does that work? If I have some toxins in a jar and I add water, is there less toxins in the jar than there were? Are there fewer toxins than there were? No, just diluted. It's diluted, but did he become less toxic? No. No, he didn't, did he? But we've been taught that you drink water to remove toxins. And yet it doesn't work, does it? You just, you drink water, all it does is add water. It doesn't remove anything, but it does dilute the toxins. In fact, any animal that has been poisoned will seek water. That's a, that's a known fact. If you poison any animal that eats anything that is poisonous to it, will seek water. Anybody here ever seek water after a Chinese meal? <laughs> Have you been poisoned? Mm -hmm. Of course. I would like you to think in your head just as an experiment for a week or two. Instead of thinking, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, think, I've been poisoned, I've been poisoned. What have you been poisoned by? MSG. You've been MSG. MSG. That's a little specific. There's only, there's, there's essentially two kinds of poisons that we need to worry about. There's the poisons that 
come from outside of us. They all make us thirsty. That's the stuff we eat and the stuff we breathe. Primarily the stuff we eat. If we eat anything that we... I mean, what a concept. What kind of people can actually create food that is not health food? You know, I mean, when there only was a... When there only was acoustic guitar, it wasn't called acoustic guitar, it was just called guitar. <laughs> okay? And then eventually there became electric guitar, and so we had to differentiate between electric and acoustic. And it used to be there was only food. Why did we have to name health food as food? We had other kinds of food. We had other kinds of food. We had junk food, essentially. So the man is almost dead now on that island for lack of water, thank you. And, and we add water and it doesn't make him less toxic. All it did is dilute his toxins to an acceptable level because there are also toxins that are created within us. The metabolic byproducts, the waste produced by every cell are toxic to us. It's got to be removed and at some point it's flowing through our system. It's in the cell, then it's in the extracellular tissue, extracellular fluids, and then it's in, picked up by the lymphatic system, and then it's dumped off at the, at the subclavial artery, and it's dumped into the bloodstream, and then it's got to find its way to the liver, where it's going to be, where it's going to be chemically detoxed, and then it's going to find its way to the kidneys, where it's going to be mechanically filtered out. There's toxins all the time in our system. And if they're not kept at a level that is dilute enough, for us to handle, we don't handle it. We don't function. We end up becoming what we call heat stressed due to lack of water. We end up going hyponatremic due to loss of the extracellular sodium simply because we were losing so much water to try to stay cool in our fitness activities. We didn't have enough water to keep our own mineral balance going. which very nicely leads us to minerals. But before it does, we covered sugar. And the interesting thing about sugar is that it's not only the fuel of choice, but it's the fuel that is readily available in fruit. Fruit looks good when it comes to sugar. But fruit also looks good when it comes, yes, can you? Sorry, I didn't that's right. Um, fruit also looks good when it comes to water. You know, yeah, think about fruit. fruit. Most fruits average about 98% of their weight is water. I dehydrated a watermelon one time. <laughs> Just to see. Ended up with a sheet of paper. <laughs> you know, not the rind, but just the fruit itself. A sheet of paper. It was amazing. Weighed like a sheet of paper. We start talking about critical nutrients for athletes, water, sugar, fruit, looks pretty good. I teach a style of nutrition I call Goldilocks nutrition. It's really simple. We're not looking for too much of anything. And we're not looking for too little of anything. We're looking for foods whose nutrient components, whose nutrient package most closely mimics our nutrient needs. The foods whose nutrient package most closely mimics our nutrient needs are invariably going to be the optimum foods for human health and human performance, and there are exceptions to that. In every single category of nutrition, from vitamins and minerals and enzymes and coenzymes and antioxidants and phytonutrients and fiber and water and protein and fat and carbohydrates, on through any area that you wish to look at in nutrition, in every area of nutrition, fruit comes closer to mimicking human nutritional needs than any other food source, any other food group. That's pretty astonishing. Not too much, not too little. We've got to give up on this idea of the best source equating to the highest source. And you say, what's the best source of potassium? Oh, bananas. What's the best source of vitamin C? Oranges. What's the best source of omega-3 fatty acids? Oh, cod liver oil or flax oil. You go, no, no, no. Those are the highest sources. Those aren't the best sources. The best sources would be Goldilocks nutrition. I can get you that shoe. You like that shoe? 
I can get you those shoes, those exact shoes. I have an in with the, I have an in with those people, and I can get you that exact shoe for four dollars a pair. Great. Thank How you. many pairs do you want? Start with four. Okay. The only thing is they're size twenty-eight. <laughs> More is not better. <laughs> Lay on the sun in Quito, lay on the mountaintop in Quito, Ecuador, June 21st, on the equator, 14,000 feet. Lay out naked at 7 a.m. By noon, you'll be in the hospital. Crisp. More is not better. Start jumping up and down on this chair. Maybe two chairs high. Big jump. Up onto there. Get some of the athletes. I can jump that. Yeah, okay, jump up and down all day. No, more is not better. It's called, there's a difference between overload. Oop, doesn't, doesn't work as well when it's off, huh? Yeah, something's wrong. My daddy was an electrician. He says, plug it in. <laughs> That's what I know about electrics. <laughs> Electronics. Okay. More is not better when it comes to sports nutrition. We're looking for foods whose nutrient content most closely mimics our nutritional needs, but in the concept of body salts and there's about a dozen different relevant body salts the most crucial ones to us being potassium and sodium in the issues of the minerals fruits don't actually match up with our nutritional needs as athletes we exceed the minerals provided in fruits alone we have to go to our second best source, which is vegetables. Yeah, and, and the, on the concept of more is not necessarily better, I mean, I've heard about people who drink too much water and they don't have enough minerals. Is that better than that? Yes, there, is a, there must be a balance between minerals and water, but, but the body is very good at regulating the amount of water in the system. You have to control the amount of minerals in the system by consumption. Now this typically, if I can save it, if I can save it, I will get to it. Because I've got like seven minutes left. Um, in the world of nutrition, again, in order to objectify, I'd like to go on record stating that I recommend the consumption of whole foods. And I recommend a diet of fruits and vegetables. As much vegetables as you care for. I recommend more vegetables in terms of greens, when I'm talking about vegetables, talk about greens, salad fixings if you're from Georgia. Uh, recommend more greens, as far as I know, than anyone else in the world of sports nutrition. And what I recommend is that you consume almost half your volume from greens. But I don't ever measure volume in that way. What I measure is calories. That's far more objective. What I'm looking for is a range of 2 to 4 percent of total calories consumed from vegetables, from dark green leafy vegetables, light green leafy vegetables, young tender greens. Approximately 3 percent of your total calories from greens. How much is that in food? For a group of athletes, it's somewhere between a head of romaine and two heads of romaine a day on average. Doesn't mean you have to eat it every day. Some days you might not eat greens at all. You might just be thrilled with the fruit because it's so good. But on the days, if you average your nutrition out through a year, that's what we're looking for. I recommend a diet that is so low in fat that it allows for optimum human performance. Anything over 10% of calories from fat will result in measurable loss in our ability to transfer and uptake, I'm sorry, transfer and utilize oxygen. It doesn't affect our ability to uptake oxygen, but once it gets into the bloodstream, it affects our ability to transfer and utilize oxygen. Once fat consumption goes beyond 10% of calories consumed, if you eat 2,000 calories a day, that's 200 calories from fat. If you eat 4,000 calories, it's 400 from fat. Single digit calories in fat will make not only for op optimum uptake, transfer and utilization of sugars, fuel, but also for optimum transport and utilization of oxygen. Oxygen and fuel 
are kind of important to an athlete. And so fat plays a huge role. And the issue there, as I'm, as I'm trying to make clear, is not about how much, but how little. We're recommending sing, single digit fat consumption. So now we have water, sugar, minerals, and fat. And in every issue, in every instance, fruits come closer to mimicking human nutritional needs. If you ate nothing but fruit today, your fat consumption for the day would be around 5% of total calories consumed because average fruits run around 5% of calories from fat. <coughs> Am I recommending that you live on fruits only? No, not at all. Fruits and young tender greens. That's the diet. Anything else should be considered a condiment. I'm not telling you don't eat it. We eat for a lot of different reasons. People are funny that way. We eat because we're lonely and we eat because we're in a group of people. We eat because we're happy and we eat because we're sad. We eat just because it's time and we eat sometimes even because we're hungry. But very few of us ever actually experience hunger. Most people eat due to what they call appetite, which is the nice word, the socially acceptable word for craving, which is the socially acceptable word for addiction. Appetite and addiction, essentially the same word. Now, so the question one more time had to do with people going hyponatremic or low in, new, low in minerals, especially sodium, because they drank so much water. Essentially what happens is if you are on a high sodium diet, you become extremely efficient at losing sodium. If you then do a hard sports activity, you may be so efficient at losing sodium that while you're drinking lots of water, you blow your sodium out of your cell. The sodium is already, or out of your body, the sodium is already out here. Sodium's outside, potassium is inside. It's easy to remember if you just remember the old rock and roll band, Ike and Nina, or something like that. Wasn't that Ike and Nina? Tina. Oh yeah, that was it. But anyway, you can still remember Ike and Ina and it'll get you close enough. And now it's such a bad joke. It's such a bad joke that you couldn't possibly forget which is which. And the sodium is extracellular, okay? And the potassium is intracellular. And now you know which goes with which. And so the sodium goes out first and then a person ends up, ends up in that challenge problem. Now, what's cool is that the human body is incredibly efficient. It's an amazing, amazing, I mean, I did the math one time and, and if we actually ran on gasoline, human beings could run at something like 18,000 miles per gallon. I mean, we're really efficient compared to a lot of things, like our cars. And, and if you go onto a low sodium diet, it takes approximately two weeks for the body to fully adapt to, remove, to lowering the amount of p sodium that's lost in our perspiration to a point where it's negligible. And so it's only either if you're on a high diet and, it, and hit ex extremely high exertion and high water consumption, or you're on, you were on a high diet and you just switched to low, and then you find that same experience. Otherwise, after two weeks, you're, you're no longer, I can, I can out exert anybody in terms of sweat. I can drink gallons and not go low in minerals because I'm not losing them through my perspiration because I've been on a low sodium diet since 1967 when my uncle sat up in bed and died. I said, ooh, and that was all he got out and he died and they blamed that on too much salt in his diet and we cut, diet, we cut salt off the table and we didn't know about why at the time. But if you think in terms of the same way that your body adapts to sunlight in a matter of weeks, you become incredibly adept at accepting less sunlight or incredibly adept at accepting more, you gain or lose your tan, it's about the same speed in terms of our mineral consumption, especially sodium. Is an objective um, indicator of how salty your sweat is? It's a fairly good indicator, but essentially all we have to do is not consume the foods that make us thirsty. Salt plays no role in an athlete's diet. I know when I was a kid, they used to give us salt tablets to avoid the kind of issues you were concerned. But then they'd give us more water and more salt and more water. And I'm trying to lose weight. Right? I'm trying to lose weight so I can run a little faster around the stupid quarter mile track. And, they're, and I'm drinking a gallon of water to make up for the thirst that I just got because they just gave me the salt tablets. Now I'm carrying eight extra pounds while I try to go run around. The, it was absolutely insane. And so the role that I'm always going to come back to 
to tie the beginning with the ending is that what I'm looking for is an approach that will allow me to correct situations rather than remedy or supplement them. I want to correct them. I don't want to supplement it. I don't want to add a crutch or provide a crutch. I don't want to try to suppress it. I want to correct it. It implies a certain responsibility to the individual that in our society we've certainly been trained not to accept. Right? But as athletes we start to come back to the idea that, oh yes, in fact, we are responsible for ourselves. There's no way around it. Nobody can train for you. I'm going to be around the rest of the day. I appreciate you guys giving me time. Thank you very much. <laughs>